Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone here to uh, Spotlight on Spotlight, our event for today and tomorrow. Um, my name is Mike Appleby. I'm head of technology here at the Yale Center for British Art. And on behalf of my colleagues here at the center and at the Yale University Library, we'd like to welcome you to campus if you're visiting and um, welcome you to this presentation. Uh, let me just run through a brief introduction to our, our speakers today. Um, First off will be Stu Snydman, who is an Associate Director for Digital Strategy at Stanford University Library. Um, he oversees development activities uh, around uh, discovery and uh, delivery services for digital assets. He helps steer the library's digitization programs and directing uh, the operations of its six digitization labs. And he has more recently taken on a leadership role with the Center for Interdisciplinary Digital Research uh, Stanford University Library's Digital Humanities and Computational Social Sciences Research and Development Group. I also know Stu through his involvement in the uh, International Image Interoperability Framework, or IIIF, where he has a leadership role in the development of the mirrored or uh, viewer, book viewer, uh, image viewer. Um, our second speaker will be Gary Geisler, who is a user uh, experience designer in the Digital Library Systems and Services Group, again, at Stanford University Library. Um, and he has helped design and develop applications, including Spotlight, um, and is leading design efforts for Arclight and Hydra in a Box. Chris Beer uh, from Stanford is a software developer, and again, in the DLSS group, um, and contributes to Blacklight, Spotlight, and Hydra. And we also have uh, Trey Pendragon here from uh, Princeton University Library. He's a digital infrastructure software developer. So uh, without any further delay, I'll uh, yield the podium to Stu. Morning. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we are really happy to be here. Um, and I first off want to thank um, Eric, James, and Tracy McMath, and Mike Frischa, and uh, the Yale Libraries and YCBA for, for hosting this event. We're really excited. Um, we've been working on Spotlight for a handful of years. Um, it seemed, we still feel like it's early days, but, um, but momentum is building, interest is growing, so we're excited to be here on the East Coast um, uh, talking about and showing Spotlight to, to a few of you. So this, is a, this was conceived of as a, as a, as a two-day event. So to give you a sense of what we're going to try to accomplish, what we're going to do um, uh, this morning, um, I'll give a presentation presentation. So um, a high level overview and introduction to Spotlight, um, a little bit of history and context and why we started this project in the first place. Um, then Gary and I, mostly Gary and I'll do a little bit of narrating, are going to build a Spotlight exhibit live. So. We will, we will test the, 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 live, the live demo gods and see what happens, but we're going to try to build, see, so, so, that, so that we can show you what, what it takes to actually build one of these things um, in real time. Um, and then we're going to hear from Trey, and he's going to talk to us about um, uh, Spotlight at Princeton. So we've been really excited to see uh, Trey investing some time and energy to deploy Spotlight and do some additional development and be a part of this community, so that's been great. And then we'll, um, we'll have some opportunities for interaction and QA in the middle, but we'll, we'll try to confine most of the QA um, to the end. Uh, we'll break for lunch. Um, and then in the afternoon we'll get back and we'll have a much more interactive session. Um, were, the, were, the, were the index cards, did the index card thing happen? So did people pick up index cards? No. no. Okay. So um, what, one of the things that we'd like to do, because we know how many people here are would, would self-identify as software engineers who might do some software development or implementation of Spotlight. Big, like, high raise of hands. I'm just trying to get a sense. So in the registration, I think there were 17 software developers might show up later, might come in the afternoon. And how many people are more involved in uh, management, policy, curation, selection? Raise of hands. Okay, that's almost everybody else. I'm, sure, I'm curious. Uh, what the third category is. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. So um, one of the things we'd like folks to be able to do is people came with real specific, I think some people may have, a lot of you came to what is Spotlight? Why should it be interesting to me? Why is Yale considering this? Or why is my institution if you're not from Yale? 
considering this, but others might have more specific questions. I want to use this in, um, in DH projects, or, um, or you might have some specific engineering questions. So what we'd like to do is have people write those questions down, and we're going to do a little sorting exercise over lunch, and then we'll structure the afternoon conversation based on your specific needs, because we have some time today, and we want to make sure that you leave knowing what you want to know, knowing what you need to know about Spotlight, so you all can, can decide how to proceed. Um, so we'll pass those index cards around and um, write one, two, three things that you really want to come away today knowing, and we'll make sure that we get it covered. Um, and then tomorrow there is a, a workshop that will primarily be facilitated by Chris Beer and Trey um, uh, for, the, for the developers uh, to actually do a live deployment and talk about how, they, how you might build it and implement it um, at Yale or your institution and do further development. So uh, that's the agenda, and that's, we have as much time as we need tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow during the day to do that. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the agenda. So uh, how many people are here from Yale? Any part of Yale? Okay, good. How many people are here from someplace other than Yale? Awesome. Welcome. That's great. Welcome, everybody. Um, so uh, Eric sent me the... Uh, the registration, and I was really excited to see the array of, of folks that registered. It's a free event, so sometimes we, we know that, that not everybody shows, but it's really exciting to see um, all the different um, units uh, and divisions at Yale that have some interest in Spotlight, um, as well as all the institutions, mostly up and down the East Coast, but not exclusively, um, who are here to potentially bring Spotlight back to their institutions. So just to give you a sense of who's here and who's interested, and you know, Spotlight is a community project. So knowing who your community is, um, especially in geographic proximity, so you can all help each other when you uh, get on your way is a, is a useful thing. So, um, so we start with the premise. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why Spotlight. So we start with the premise that images are fundamental carriers of cultural heritage, and I don't need to convince this group of that. Um, you know, and they are this enduring carrier of, of, of meaning and, and history. Um, and we have built big programs to digitize our image collections and uh, make them available and usable for all manner of, um, of, uh, of purposes in, uh, in the, the academic domain, in the library domain, in the museum domain, and elsewhere. Um, so we've built big digitization programs and over the years, lots of technology to make these usable and accessible. So I'll talk a little bit about how we showcase our image collections at Stanford, and I think this is not a unique story. Um, we've got a wide array of ways in which we make our image collections knowable to our communities, right? So, and I'll, I'll talk about Stanford, and I think some of this will resonate. I don't have a lot of examples for other institutions because I know Stanford well. Um, so at, at its simplest, we, we advertise. So we have a Drupal infrastructure in our library web, and we uh, advertise the existence of new collections in blog posts or news articles. And that's kind of the simplest, most basic way we might do it. Um, we, we have this, uh, this content management environment. So we have enabled our curators and uh, in some cases faculty to build um, custom sites in Drupal. So it's, it's more or less self-serve, uh, and curators can build uh, exhibit sites, draw some digital images, you know, download the images from wherever, and upload them into Drupal and create, a, create an exhibit site to provide a little bit more context and showcase the, the, uh, the collection. A third way in which we make our image collections uh, accessible is in our online uh, repository environment. Um, our catalog, so as some of you, as many of you, we're a Blacklight uh, and Hydra institution, if you know what that means. Um, and our online catalog is called SearchWorks, and when we digitize our images, um, they automatically uh, find their way into our online, our online repository, so they get persistent citation pages and URLs with an interactive way of looking at the image, and then they also find their way into our online catalog, so they can be discovered along with um, all the other materials we have at Stanford. Not a lot of uh, intellectual scaffolding or context associated here. There might be a little blurb, but you can, you can get to our images amongst the other 9 million or 10 million objects in our, um, in our catalog. And then finally, um, we have all manner of custom-built digital collection websites. Um, 
We, uh, this is one example of the French Revolu Revolution Digital Archive. There was an 18 month period, um, uh, three or four years ago, where we spent, we built three digital collections, um, kind of simultaneously. We had teams of three or four developers, user experience designers, project managers. Um, we got some grants um, and some donations and we invested a lot of energy in, in building these three. Uh, uh, custom digital collections, and they all have slightly different user interfaces, they all have slightly different features, they all live on different servers, and on, they're all in blacklight, um, but they're highly customized. Um, and it was expensive. And we have a lot more than three collections that we wanna showcase um, in this way. So this slide is, um, is a slide that, we've, that, that Gary actually came up with years ago when we were trying to explain to people where Spotlight fits in the array of solutions for, for, um, uh, for making accessible our digital image collections. So, and on the horizontal axis at the bottom, we see kind of, it, 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 it's the depth and complexity of exposure. So how sophisticated we can make um, the, 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 inter the interaction um, with, the, with the collection. And the vertical axis, um, is the time and resources it takes to actually to actually do it. So in the in the bottom left hand corner, it's pretty simple. The simple news pages um, or splash page or a very simple or basic exhibit collection site. Um, not a lot of depth, um, but really easy. Totally self service. Don't need engineers to do it. Um, in the middle, getting it into the digital repository, um, uh, putting it in the library catalog. Well, you can do some search, so you can kind of be a little bit more sophisticated on how you dive into a collection. Um, takes a little bit more work uh, from the technical units, right? Because you have to do some engineering to build that workflow. Um, but really still not a whole lot of, of, of depth and complexity. And then in the upper right hand corner, you've got the really expensive and time intensive effort to, to build a custom solution. But you also have the opportunity to, to, to have a lot of depth. Um, you, your experts, your content experts can do a lot of writing. You can you know, feature individual items. Um, do acknowledgments and the whole and the whole kit, but that takes engineers and, and time and effort and resources. So there was an empty spot, um, and that's where we kind of fit Spotlight, um, where we really want to make the depth and complexity and sophistication of the interaction a bit higher, but we still want it to be awfully easy for folks to do it and not really need um, need engineers and, and and lots of resources to get it done. Um, so this is, this is, we can conceive the spotlight and we were at an event about four years ago with a bunch of other engineers and digital library folks and we learned that this is not a unique, this is not a unique story. There are variations on it, um, but everybody's kind of coming up with this wide array of solutions and none of them seem very scalable, um, nor do they do justice to the collections that we're trying to, to feature. Um, so we came up with the idea of spotlight. Um, and it is an open source solution enabling librarians, curators, and others to create attractive, feature-rich websites that highlight their digital collections. So the four major um, features or components of Spotlight, um, one, we want it to be full featured. So um, uh, a focused website with lots of options for highlighting collections, lots of, lots of interesting features. Um, second though, we needed it to be more or less self-service. Right? We wanted the, our curators um, and our exhibit builders to be able to do this without a lot of support from the technical teams. Um, we also wanted it to be well integrated. So one of the problems with our Drupal environment is it wasn't deeply integrated. All of our images are in our digital repository infrastructure, but to build an exhibit from it, we'd have to download those images and upload them to a CMS, and then we have lots of duplication. We didn't, we didn't have the chance to leverage the sophisticated and deep metadata that's created for some of these objects. We'd have to replicate that in a CMS. Um, so we really wanted to find a way to integrate our exhibit solution into our digital library pipeline. Um, but we also wanted it to be flexible. So we wanted curators and others to be able to do lots of customization. Customization of facets, customization of metadata labels, some customization of layout and user experience. So we had, we had some, some ambitions um, with Spotlight, and these were the, 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 the kind of key features. So importantly, Spotlight is an extension of Blacklight. So how many people know what Blacklight is or have heard of Blacklight? Okay, so I, 
nearly everybody. Um, and this is the digital library discovery environment. It's an open source um, community that's got tens of peer institutions of ours around the world um, who use this as uh, a basis for their, for, their, for their discovery environments and their catalogs. And um, Blacklight um, takes advantage of, is an extension of, is an extension of, of or Spotlight is an extension of Blacklight. So it, it has all of the features of Blacklight. And as the Blacklight community continues to build new features, they come to Spotlight too. Right, so, so you benefit from that. And you also benefit from a vibrant community of peers who work together and communicate well with each other and um, support each other and sustain the software over the long term. So um, the relationship between Spotlight and Blacklight was, was really important. Um, Blacklight is also part of the Hydra stack, um, the, the Hydra digital repository stack. How many people have heard of Hydra? Good. So we're a Hydra institution, um, and Hydra also includes uh, uh, Fedora on the back end, um, and has some other um, architectural nuances that we don't need to go into here. One of, the, one of the things that folks thought early on in the days of Spotlight was that you needed to be a Hydra institution to use Spotlight, and that's not the case, in fact. Um, Spotlight does not require a Fedora repository. It doesn't even, even re require integration into your repository. As we'll see, you can create a Spotlight exhibit based on a spreadsheet that's got pointers to images on Flickr um, or in some local file space. Um, you can use Spot Spotlight to build exhibits uh, from IIIF uh, collections and resources around the world, which is kind of exciting. Um, so so it's, 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 it's related to the Hydra community and the Hydra, um, and the Hydra technology stack. Many, there's a lot of overlap in institutions but it's not a dependency. And in the earliest presentations we've made about Spotlight, that was kind of a, a misconception, so I think I over, overstate the point now in presentations that it's not a, it's not a, it's not a thing. So, so now what I want to get into is a little bit about, um, and I'll, maybe I'll hop out and just, we'll just look at a couple of exhibits. So we've been working on Spotlight for about three, four years, um, and we've developed it to a point where we've now deployed it in production at Stanford. Um, you know, the, the basics, um, we think, we can make visually attractive uh, websites that importantly are responsive to mobile devices, so it works well on mobile devices, and accessible. Um, so online accessibility is a real important um, uh, uh, mandate at Stanford and other institutions. So from the beginning, we built Spotlight to be accessible. Um, uh, there's custom home pages. We have the ability to browse collections based on different kinds of metadata values um, or tags. Um, the ability to create any number of custom feature pages, so thematic pages that allow you to maybe highlight certain themes or certain special components of collections. But we also get all the facet-based searching and browsing of a very robust online uh, catalog um, and uh, lots of different ways to, to, view, to view search results. So there's some screenshots here that aren't nearly as fun as doing a little bit of a live demo. So why don't I just kind of motor through that and hop out to, um, to my uh, disk not being, oh wait, all right. So I think I need to uh, do that. And this is gonna be a little discordant for me. All right, so, so this is uh, Stanford's implementation of Spotlight. Um, we now have live, what's that, a dozen exhibits, and I'm actually logged in, so I'll just show you something. So this is a, a, a me as an administrator view. Um, if I go to unpublished exhibits, you'll see um, these are all the exhibits that people are working on. So um, you have the ability to kind of work on uh, much like a CMS, you have the ability to work on new exhibits in a, in a, in a live environment. Um, but the important thing is we have 12 live exhibits and probably 30 that are in progress. Um, and exhibits can take anywhere from uh, a handful of hours to build if you make them quite minimal to, to weeks. But the real work in building an exhibit is the content. Um, we try to make it relatively easy to build, which we'll see. So, you know, one of our, our, favorite, our, our favorite first exhibits to, to demonstrate is um, the Bob Fitch Photography Archive. 
Um, Bob Fitch was a notable photographer of um, luminaries in the civil rights and social justice movement. Um, and he took tens of thousands of, of images and recently donated them to Stanford in, in digital form. Um, and we're in the process of adding those to our digital collections. Um, and we have, uh, uh, we've, we've built an exhibit, or our, to, be, to, be, to be clear, our curator for British and American history built an exhibit um, to feature uh, this collection. So we have a, a customized homepage, and the homepages can look an awful, can look, can look much different. Um, with a customized banner, you see the search box in the, at the top. You're seeing this edit button again only because I'm logged in. Um, and, you know, we've got, there was a printed catalog, so the curator uh, um, and the folks that published the beautiful printed catalog um, were, were, were quite keen to have that on a page, so they were able to build a page that, uh, that, that highlights the, 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 um, the catalog. There's an about section. Um, and there's some interesting things here. It's got uh, contact information for the curators. It's got a little description of the collection. It's got uh, links to published books by Bob Fitch. Um, and here's a case in which we actually did a, um, a 3D scan of the exhibit space. Um, and because uh, it was a temporary, right? So we wanted to capture the physical work that went into building uh, this exhibit. Um, and, and somebody can actually, now that the exhibit's no longer, no longer there, you can walk around the Stanford's rotunda and I'm not, and you can see the cases, you know, and that kind of thing. But the real kind of, the, the real fun of it is, is so we've got kind of all of that, all of that context wrapped around the, uh, the exhibit. Um, so there are, I think, tens of different subcategories of this collection or subcollections, each of which now has uh, what we call a browse category. And this is really simply a saved search, right? So I search on, I, and when, when Gary gets into the building, he'll show you, I can search on Cesar Chavez um, as a sub-collection. And uh, so now I get access to, the, to, the, to all the items in the Cesar Chavez sub-collection. One of the things you may have noticed is the banner changed at the top. So the curator decided that having a banner that featured a march by Martin Luther King in the top banner of the Cesar Chavez um, exhibit you know, uh, why not have why not have a Cesar Chavez image up there? So th th that's an example of the kind of customization you can do. Um, we can contextualize the Cesar Chavez sub collection, and then we can look at um, look at the results. We can look at the results in different kinds of views, like a kind of Pinterest style or a basic list um, or a slideshow. Um, and then, as in as in um, any exhibit, you'd want to be able to click through to the object um, and see a kind of a deep zoomable um, version of the image uh, with, with, to whatever extent there's metadata, the metadata will, will display. Um, so that's, that's the basic, that's the, the, the basic rundown. Um, other examples, just to show you some of the diversity that's possible. So, um, the David Rumsey Map Center um, recently opened a uh, physical and digital uh, map center at Stanford, um, has a spotlight exhibit. And uh, there, again, this, this one has, I can't see how many is that? 160, 160 items right now. But they've created um, kind of little feature pages. Um, that have, uh, um, that highlight specific items in the collection and whether it was David Rumsey himself or our curator was able to pick out particular items um, in different locations or in different subcategories and, uh, and uh, author some text um, to, to wrap some context or intellectual narrative around, um, around the collection. Um, so that's another example. Um, I love the the, uh, the Harrison Newton collection, and this is the one where I really realized that that Spotlight had taken off at Stanford because I had no idea the curator was was building this. So typically in the early days, they'd contact us and let us know that they were building an exhibit, and and uh, this was a beautifully done job by the curator of this collection. Um,
So what, what didn't I show? Oh, so one of the things I may not, may not have shown is just the basic search features. So, so I search for Alabama in the search and I get a search result. Um, and it turns out I have search results from across a handful, five, six sub collections. So I have my facet drill down um, and I can drill down by, by, uh, by topic, for example, um, and now are my results. So all of the features of, of Blacklight as a discovery environment. So that's a basic kind of overview. We can spend more time later looking at other collections. Um, I'm gonna hop back to the, uh, I'm gonna hop back to the presentation. If I can make this disappear. Nope, I don't wanna show you that yet. Oh, and full screen, thank you. Let's just do that, okay. So, um, so the exhibit creator perspective, and we're gonna do an extensive live demo of this, so I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but some basic things. Um, you can customize the site identity, like the title, subtitle, and contacts. You can customize your banners um, and the images that you use for your browse features. Um, there's a user management um, and role management, so we can have different roles assigned to administrators, curators, um, other, other, types of, other types of access to build collections and exhibits. Um, there's uh, nice ways to um, customize what metadata values actually appear in different, um, in, in different result pages. Um, and in fact, the ability for the, for the exhibit builder to customize the labels of the, um, the metadata fields that appear in your results page. It's something you can't, you'd, some, sometimes you'd love to do in your catalog and you can't do it. Um, you can do it in, in, in Spotlight. Um, easily created browse categories. Um, and then a, wi a widget based page configuration. Um, so the ability to build these custom about and feature pages using a variety of widgets. And Gary's gonna show you how we can build a page um, in much the way these kind of forms based CMSs allow you to, to build a page. So a couple other features that are notable. Um, so Spotlight uh, integrates the International Image Interoperability Framework in a variety of ways. So I think I've done a show of, how many people have heard of IIIF? Same number of hands, I love it. So Yale has obviously been um, a, a, a major um, contributor um, and leader in the IIIF um, initiative. So, um, and of course Stanford's been involved in that and Princeton's been involved in that. So it was really important for us to, to, to make sure that, that the IIIF is well integrated. Um, some of the ways in which IIIF is integrated, um, and I think Trey's gonna show you, uh, show you this um, a bit more when he does his demo because Princeton's gone kind of a long way with this. Um, we have the ability to create exhibits based on IIIF images or collections that are at other institutions. So if you wanted to, um, augment your exhibit with images or collections from other institutions that have complementary um, complementary items. You can you can pretty easily do that if you know the IIIF uh, uh, IIIF URI. I believe in Princeton they're using the uh, the Universal Viewer as their their main viewer. Um, I have heard that Harvard, who is a leader in the in, in along with Stanford in the Mirador development, that they're going to make an effort to integrate Mirador. Um, into uh, into Spotlight, um, and then Triple F is 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 functioning in the in the back end of, of of Spotlight as well. So when you add images to Spotlight, they become Triple um, uh hosted and addressable. I mean that's relatively new work. Um, as an aside, Stanford just finished a uh, four weeks development cycle on Spotlight, and some of that Triple F work happened during that cycle. So there's some rough edges and some polish to put around the edges, but, uh, but we've worked hard on some of that IIIF integration. Um, a second new feature, if I understand correctly, some of, maybe it's YCDA's exhibit platform is heavily based on um, maps and timelines. Um, and uh, and uh, Jack Reed from, from Stanford, who is the, um, the original developer of something called uh, Geo Blacklight, has built a, <clears throat> a plugin called Blacklight Heat Maps. Um, and this is a way to display results 
uh, of items that have geo metadata. So geo names, uh, long lat, lat long points, um, uh, four corners, um, metadata, so that if you have geo metadata, uh, you can see the results of a search uh, plotted on a map, in this case uh, as a heat map, and then you can kind of drill into the map to get to some of your results, and then when you get to a show page or a results page, you can see that result geolocated on a map. Um, this is very, very new work. Um, in fact, I think just before this, uh, just before this presentation, Chris was able to get a collection working, and I believe it's the Renaissance. Hello, Fitch. Thank you. There we go. So, if I go to a search result. Am I on it? Feels like I'm on it. But I slow, there we go, okay. So, and then if I go to the map search results, we see a heat map overlay. Um, and I can zoom in on that, that heat map to a specific location, and the, I believe the purple indicates um, a slightly more dense population of results, and then I see my list of results, and then I can I can go to that result. Um, what's not What's not showing here is that somewhere on this page, probably in this empty space, we haven't quite designed it yet, will be um, a map uh, with a um, with a pin or a bounding box that shows you the location of this particular result. Um, so, uh, and there are more geospatial features to come. Um, there have been some um, unanticipated uses of Spotlight. So, um, so we primarily conceived the Spotlight for digital collections and exhibits, um, primarily from our library program. Um, the library also uh, manages our, our institutional repository, which is destination for faculty papers and and increasingly student work. Um, and in a, in a conversation with the registrar's office, we uh, brought up Spotlight. And uh, um, are people familiar with the concept of the e-portfolio? Yeah, so, so e-portfolio is, um, in particular at Stanford um, and, and elsewhere, it's a way for students to, um, in particular undergrads, to showcase their student work. Um, in some cases, in, uh, as they work for a, for a notation or some sort of credential, the portfolio is kind of a final work product that showcases a handful of papers or presentations or research projects. And then they actually live, uh, live on beyond the student's time at the institution, and they sometimes reference them on their CVs or resumes, and usually get jobs, et cetera. So um, we decided in the spring, or the registrar asked us in the spring to uh, do a pilot. So they have long used a project called uh, Digitation to produce e-portfolios. Um, and because we've been talking about depositing student work into the repository, the idea of using a platform like Spotlight that's well integrated into the repository to showcase those materials and have them kind of citable and preservable um, was interesting. So uh, Gary and I and our uh, science uh, librarian spent a quarter with a group of 15 undergraduates who are pursuing notation and science communication um, uh, 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 credential um, in their introduction to e-portfolio um, making. And uh, the 15 students use Spotlight um, to build their e-portfolios. Um, this is really early 
this is so that, and this is a kind of a little screenshot on the left of the the, the portfolio produced in, in Digication, and this is a screenshot on the right of the, the portfolio built in Spotlight. So um, it's it's this is a really kind of fresh. It was spring quarter. It's a really fresh experiment, um, and we're going to continue with probably another class um, and try to do uh, try to see see where this goes. Um, a second unanticipated use um, has been the use of Spotlight uh, in instruction. Um, our, our curator and our, our digital medieval um, uh, expert and program manager at Stanford, his name is Ben Albritton, um, he's known to many of you. Uh, he taught a class um, a few quarters ago and that was based on medieval manuscript uh, fragments and full manuscripts that are in Stanford's repository um, and he asked the students to use Spotlight to construct their final their final projects so they they drew the materials from uh, the repository images from the repository and they built Spotlight pages and the end result was an exhibit um, based on uh, that class so that was a neat experience and we've heard other uh, we've heard other examples of faculty who are interested in, in doing something similar. Um, so using content that the libraries uh, are stewards of and have in the repository um, in classes for, for, for coursework. Um, spotlight in the wild, right? So there are other implementations. Trey's going to show you his at Princeton. Um, the University of Victoria has spun up uh, two new exhibits in Spotlight. So you can see they, it looks quite a bit different but uh, has all the same features. Um, and they're actually currently working on a Google Maps integration, um, as well as integration with Sketchfab, so they can create um, uh, digital exhibits using, uh, featuring their 3D, their 3D objects. So that's, that's a good example of commu the, the community at work. Um, so what's next, or what's on the wish list? Um, so there are a handful of features that aren't quite there yet. Um, that we'd love to build ourselves or we'd love to see other members of the community who are interested in, in adopting this to build. So full text, well there is actually full text support in one of our exhibits, but full text with hit highlighting is something that if you have full text collections, that's kind of a, 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 um, an obvious uh, um, desire. Um, additional geo features like the geolocating an item on a map in the results page or the Google Maps integration. Um, so more formats. Right now, uh, Spotlight has been optimized for images, but of course we have audio, we have video, we have uh, PDFs, uh, 3D representations, other kinds of formats. So we really want to extend the platform to be very supportive of other formats. Um, theming and templates. So some of the feedback we've gotten, and it was a little bit by design, and we can talk about this a little bit more in Q&A. Um, by design, we made the user experience fairly kind of uniform. Um, we wanted some more consistency, some consistency of user experience, um, consistency of interaction, consistency of identity and theming. Um, so there's not a whole lot of flexibility um, in fonts and colors and kind of branding. Um, but we do know that Spotlight as an open source platform, many people want to have that flexibility. So um, I think we'll see more kind of theming options and templating options available. Um, Mirador integration, as I said, internationalization, so the ability to toggle an exhibit in multiple languages. Um, and despite the fact that Hydra is not a requirement, many in the Hydra community would like to see more integration with the Hydra stack and the Hydra workflow. I'm gonna close up. I just wanna acknowledge the team at Stanford. So just to kind of give you a sense of Stanford's investment in Spotlight, we've been working on it for about four years. Um, and this is the, the list of people at Stanford who've kind of worked on the project team over time. So um, we've, we've, I think I've got most of them and we've invested a lot of time and energy in this and we're committed to Spotlight as a platform. Um, I should also note that we have begun to think of Spotlight at Stanford as a service. Um, so as a service of our digital library and as a service to other units on campus. So we have built up a Spotlight service team. There's some acronym and some inside code there. But the members of the team not only include the folks from our digital library unit, but also from public services, the science and engineering resource group, um, special collections, and the Center for Interdis Interdisciplinary Digital Research, so our DH and Computational Social Sciences unit, because there, there are many tendrils 
um, and we, we have non-technical people on a service team to kind of do a, do a handful of things. They provide, um, they encourage spotlight use across, across campus, um, they uh, support exhibit creators, so, um, uh, so science librarians can help other science librarians build their exhibits using best practices, they're helping to build documentation, um, and then they're advising the future roadmap of Spotlight at Stanford. Um, and then of course Spotlight is an important community project for us. Um, so we, we are excited to be here. This is part of that community process. There's um, a, pro a project website and a GitHub repository that the developers will be interested in. And um, we're, we're anxious to, to, to kind of move this forward. So that's the end of the presentation, the slide presentation part of it. Um, maybe we, we switch it up and, and we do a live, a live build. Um, are there any, based on the kind of high level, questions uh, as Gary comes up and gets set up? So we had one important collection. The um, uh, Ed Feigenbaum is a, is a computer science professor at Stanford, and he uh, he contributed a very large collection of his 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 archive that had lots of full text. It had PDFs and and presentations and research papers. And this is one of these projects that we spent a year or two building with a group of engineers. And when Spotlight was finally in good shape, we decided to migrate it. But one of the requirements of that particular collection was that it had full text search. And full text search in the, in the old version, the minimum, the minimum requirement was I needed to be able to index the full text and get to the object, right? Um, so we were able to um, add full text indexing. Um, so we just, and the indexing workflow is kind of, kind of, a, kind of a, a technical challenge that I think Chris and Trey will talk to the engineers about tomorrow but we can index the, the collection and at least get the person to the right, to the right object. Um, right now, in Stanford's implementation, we can't A, get you to the page, and B, we don't find the, the coordinates of the words and then highlight them in the interface. So we've, we've built at Stanford kind of a minimum full text search that starts us down the road of being able to index the full text and get information about the page and the coordinates, but the interface hasn't been built to, to actually get the person to the page, get the user to the page, and also highlight the full text. And that's something that we very much want. We have lots of book collections and other things. It's kind of a, it's kind of a standard feature that we need to build into it. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, so I, th I think um, our, our goal here is to give you a really good sense of what it takes to actually build an exhibit. Um, and so we're going to walk through and, and kind of try to build a, a semi-complete exhibit from scratch. Um, and um, it, will, it won't be completely realistic just because I don't want to go through all the tedium of watching you do, having you watch me do several repetitive things in a row. Um, but um, I think our plan was to be fairly detailed to, so that you have a really good sense of, of what it takes to actually build an exhibit. Um, and I think as we go along, um, we'll sort of um, reinforce some of the points you made in the slides. Um, you'll see some of the same things that he brought up. Um, so just to start, um, this is our, um, sometimes we call it the exhibits landing page at Stanford. Um, but I, I wanted to point out something about this. Um, when you install Spotlight, um, you get this functionality, all the functionality you see here um, with Spotlight. The application includes um, at the root URL, which we're on here for the application, you have um, these actions that you'll see over here, uh, at least some of them, uh, the ability to uh, show your exhibits on a, on a page, um, whether they're published or unpublished, so there'll be tabs for those. Um, there's, there's features here built in to um, be able to reorder your, your exhibits, the order they show on that, that landing page. Um, there's functionality here to um, add uh, administrators, which at this level we call, usually call super admins. So these are not curators, but they're people that manage the whole um, 
exhibit insulation. Um, so Spotlight's a um, multi-tenant application, meaning um, a single, insula a single ins installation of the application allows you to have multiple exhibits. So, so that's what we're looking here is, is we can keep on adding exhibits to our installation here. Now, of course, we've at Stanford have uh, customized visually the visual design of this a lot, so it's very heavily Stanford oriented in terms of its, its look and feel. Um, but again, all these, these features you see here are um, part of the, the basic uh, vanilla spotlight um, application. So, um, so we're gonna uh, create a new exhibit, um, and to do that, uh, we would click this request a new exhibit um, button here. Um, and when you do that, you get a little form, very simple form. Um, it's really easy to get started with a new exhibit. All you really need is a title. Um, So as a policy issue, just to kind of talk while Gary's typing, as a policy issue, there are a couple different ways you can think about this, and a couple institutions do it differently. In some cases, you know, this form isn't accessible to, to, to folks, right? Uh, this is done by admins. There's some other process by which the creation of a new exhibit is vetted, right? And then maybe an admin or, or, or some kind of service manager kind of does this work. It's simple, right? They don't need an engineer to do it. But, but it's not it's not fully 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 self-service there's another approach in which you would say okay you know let's let's make it fully self-service and provide our curators um, or others the ability to spin one of these up without um, without that kind of, that yeah, kind of think, policy vetting in fact I think out of the box um, the request new exhibit uh, button would be accessible yeah. and we've just at Stanford decided recently to um, to hide, you can see it here because we're logged in as a yeah. brand. But um, this this homepage, this root root landing page for the exhibits is is available um, publicly, and um, uh, we don't show the request new exhibits um, button. For that's now. that's an example of like an interesting policy question that emerged right. once we built the technology and started to implement it. Is oh gosh, we said this was self service, so is it? I mean, how self how self service is self service, right? Um, and what are the implications of, of that? So. Um, so I've just, uh, to give you an example, I typed in a title, and um, by default, we get a, a slug. Um, again, this is a multi-tenant application, so we need a unique uh, URL for each exhibit that we're gonna build. Uh, and so uh, the form populates uh, a slug for you, but you can, you can customize that, um, and when you save, it will save whatever slug you give it. Um, I'm not actually gonna save this, just pretend I'm saving it, um, because I already created the um, sample exhibit. Uh, which is here. So this is the new exhibit I'm going to use to, for demonstration purposes. Um, and I only, I created just before uh, we started earlier, um, just because I wanted to index some items into the, the exhibit so you don't have to sit there and wait while it indexes um, the items into the exhibit. Um, but, but ordinarily you create a new exhibit and you would um, basically end up over here, let's probably here, um, which is the main page um, of the <coughs> administration side. So just a little orientation to um, how the application is set up. Um, a lot of the slides that, that Stu had in his presentation where he was showing the, the end user features, that's the whole end user side of the application that, that your exhibit visitors would, would see. And then there's a whole other side of the application which is um, the uh, for shorthand, call, we usually call it the admin side, um, and that's where your exhibit curator is actually gonna do the work to configure and, and build the exhibit for the most part. Um, and so uh, that's where we are now um, on the admin side, and um, we have a dashboard page here, which is just kind of some high level ideas over time, if, especially if you have a team working on this. Um, the dashboard gives some indication of recent activity, so you can see what other people have been work, working on um, on the exhibit here. Um, there's a bunch of other features here for configuration and curation, which I'll talk about in a second, but I wanted to give you um, uh, sort of another high level orientation of building an exhibit. And the way I usually think of it is sort of, there's three main activities it takes to build an exhibit. Um, the first is fairly simple. Uh, it's adding, adding items to the exhibit. So, it's basically just adding the, the core content uh, for your exhibit. What do you want the exhibit to be about? 
And so that's what I did this morning um, before we got started is um, I'm going to kind of do a, a simplification, a simple duplication of a, a production exhibit we have um, called the, the Herbert Motter um, exhibit. And so I've added um, a bunch of items for, for the Herbert Matter um, exhibit. And um, you can see some of them here. Uh, so that's the, the first step, is just adding the items um, uh, to the exhibit. Now there's, we'll get, we'll look at this in a second. There's several ways, well maybe I'll do it now. There's um, several ways you can add items to an exhibit. Um, and we're gonna So when you start, that would be empty. Right. Right. So, so if you'd click request this new exhibit, make this new exhibit, when Gary said I'm not going to click, when you get here, this would be completely empty. And then, so your first task would be um, to add the, the items you want to have in your exhibit. Um, now at Stanford, we've, um, we've added a customization uh, to be able to add things from the Stanford Digital Repository. And I assume many institutions would do something equivalent. Um, and so here we have a, a little form um, and uh, in this case, uh, the, the Herbert Motter um, collection, all the items are uh, associated with uh, what we call a collection druid. Um, so it's just a unique ID that represents, uh, it's a cont container for all the actual objects. I think there's around 277 uh, items in this particular collection. So all it took for us here is to add that collection druid. And then when I say add items, we have a process that goes through, takes that collection druid, looks at all the item druids that are associated with it, and it adds them to the exhibit. To be clear, that's institution-specific special sauce. Yeah. So um, if you're going to do an integration with some back-end repository, um, and I think that that's something that I know a lot of people are interested in, how, how does that process work? And I think Chris and Trey can talk about that with their engineers tomorrow. Um, but but how we how you get at the content in your repository or in whatever backend database or whatever you have is kind of special sauce. And so you know here's all the list of the actual items that we've added. Uh, but just to, to show you that there there are several other ways um, there uh, to add items. Um, there's a way to add items one at a time when you're uploading. So just from any source where you can point to uh, the the source file. And then you have some basic metadata you can you can add. You can do them that way. Um, you can also use a spreadsheet. Um, I think Sue mentioned earlier that's another option um, where uh, you can set up a spreadsheet um, with columns rep representing the the metadata fields, and then you can import that file in here, the CSV file, um, and it will add the items uh, sequentially up the, uh, from your spreadsheet. And then there's also um, the IIIF uh, URL. Uh, approach, um, so uh, which maybe uh, Trey will get into a little. I'm not sure. Um, we haven't done that much, but I think Princeton has used Triple F more. Um, so there's several ways, but um, definitely for for in most cases, I think um, either probably the Triple F URL or the the um, adding directly from your own institution repository is the way to go. So so that's the big big first activity. It's actually fairly simple in most cases. Once you have if you have your items prepared. Um, add your items to the exhibit. Uh, the other two main activities are configuring your exhibit, um, and that we'll look at that. There's a lot of different ways you can kind of tweak and customize um, the features that end users will see um, to sort of customize things to make it appropriate for what your goals for the exhibit are. So configuration is another main activity. And then the third activity is uh, building pages. So that, this is where it's like adding curatorial content, um, where the curator, as, as you, in most cases, the sort of expert in this area uh, that the exhibit represents, has the ability to create pages that, that and kind of convey their intellectual knowledge of the collection and what's, what's unique about it, what's interesting about it, and to highlight aspects of the exhibit. So those are the, the, the kind of three main activities. Um, and. Um, you, you don't have to do those in any kind of sequence. You know, you can go back and, and tweak things uh, once you built the exhibit, and you go back and add items after you've built an exhibit, um, and just go back and forth in an iterative way. Um, I think what I'm going to do here to give you a sense is I'm going to actually, before I even do much configuration, I'm going to start to build just a few things so you can kind of, um, so we can get some confidence that are, that we're um, able to actually build something interesting. 
um, maybe as a first time exhibit builder, we just want to sort of get some proof that this is going to work for our goals. So first thing I want to show is once we've added the items, um, uh, as Stu showed, uh, we have the basic search is all, all working. We can um, uh, do a search. We can use our facets to uh, narrow things down. Uh, we can change our search results views. So we can go to a gallery view. Um, we have other views that Stu showed. One thing, notice um, that there's a lot of metadata here because um, by default, we're just showing all the metadata associated with the items. Um, we'll look in a second at the configuration um, options that uh, we might not want this much metadata on, say, a gallery view or we're trying to focus on the images. And I'll show you how we can, we can fix that in a minute. Um, so what I wanted to show, the first thing, that, that to start to build some content beyond just the, the basic search, is um, I'm going to save some browse categories. So this is going to set up um, just kind of one step beyond basic search is um, create some browse categories to make it easy for somebody who's coming in and looking at this exhibit. Maybe they're just interested in the, in the, the topic of this ex exhibit and they don't really have any search you know, terms in mind. It would be nice to give them a way to sort of easy entry into the exhibit by creating some browse categories. Um, and that will give us a browse page up here. You'll see by default, the only uh, main menu item we have is home. So um, I'm going to probably use topic. Um, and um, let's see, create some, a new browse category, um, which I'll do, this one I'll pick, um, Herbert Mater took a lot of photographs of uh, Giacometti sculptures. So I'm going to do um, a search, basically. I've, I've got a search here on, focused on the topic of uh, Giacometti. And I'm going to save that search. Now this is a button that end users don't see. We are only seeing it because we're logged in as a curator. And so I just can save the search. And um, actually, I think I already saved this one. So I'm just going to save it as that. But now I've saved the search. And I can go on and, and save some other categories. Um, but uh, I'm going to show you now. Let's go and say we want to do something with that. We've, um, that browse category we've saved. So we go back to the admin side, and we're going to go to this browse um, action. And here are some, I, this is the only other thing I did before uh, uh, we got started was um, I saved some browse categories. Um, and so here's the one we just saved. I just called it Alberto. Uh, this is the version I saved earlier. So now we can go and edit this browse category. Uh, and you'll see here, none of these checkboxes are checked. Um, that means they're not pub these, none of these are published which is why we don't see anything in the main menu. Uh, this is not working. So I'm trying to edit the browse category, which of course, because this is live, does not work for some reason. Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll come back to this. Uh, browse, but browse categories is an important and easy thing to do, so I do hope we can share that. Um, well, you know, I could sh switch over um, to the live part and show that. Let me do that just while we're on the topic so it doesn't feel like I'm jumping around too much. Um, so here's the, here's the actual production exhibit that I'm trying to recreate. So, uh, go back over to the dashboard, then we go to browse, and so you'll see here, these are all the browse categories that uh, we previously had saved for this exhibit, using the process I showed you before, saving a search, um, and let's see if I do edit here, do I get that, okay, here I get it. So, so this is what, we would, what I was aiming for, um, we have a little form here where we can change that title if we want. So we, we're not stuck with the title we did when we saved the search. Um, we can add a description, uh, which I'll, I'll, I don't want to do here in our production exhibit, but uh, you can add a description, and I'll show you where that shows up later. You can pick a uh, default view. So this means when the end user 
clicks on the browse category. I'll show you how they do that in a second. Uh, this is the, the results view that they'll get by default. Um, and then there's ways to uh, create a uh, thumbnail to represent that browse category. So here we've, we've chosen an image uh, from the, the exhibit and we've cropped it and saved that. And so when we do that for all of our different browse categories, um, and we publish at least one of them, the main menu changes and we now have a browse um, option in the main menu. And when we go to that, uh, we have here the, the browse landing page. And so these are all those, those browse categories you saw a second ago in the list, um, all listed here. And now the user, the end user, has an easy way to sort of explore this exhibit. Um, they just can click on one of these and um, they get a results page. And um, here we're also um, on the gallery view because that's the, the default view for this, this browse category. Um, and also notice that you don't have all that metadata under the thumbnails, which we'll get back to. Right, which, yeah. Uh, so you just get a nice clean, clean view of, um, of this browse category. And um, one thing to show you real quick here too is that in terms of the layout of this page, the, the, this has like a dozen browse categories. Um, you can easily change the look of that page in terms of the order. Um, and this is a feature that we, we offer for, for many of the uh, configuration, uh, different aspects of the configuration. Um, you can drag and drop uh, to change the order in which those browse categories um, are shown in that browse landing page. So for example, if we wanted the, the Calder browse category to be first, we can just click that first, save it, and then we go to browse, um, the Calder uh, item is first on the browse uh, landing page. So. Uh, the whole point of this is just to show that, that it's really easy to sort of get some content generated um, quickly for your exhibit uh, just by using the save searches and, and doing a little customization of those uh, for the browse categories. Um, let's see, so uh, I think the next thing I was gonna do was then say, okay, well, we're confident that we can kind of make an interesting exhibit. Uh, and in fact, I, just as an aside, um, I think we do have a couple of exhibits that really are, are not much more than a home page and a browse category page and maybe an about page or two. So in other words, really simple exhibits that only take an hour or two to create um, that give the user some sense of what kind of um, items you have related to this topic at, at your institution, give them the way to kind of explore those items, uh, have a couple of about pages to give them some context and some background but doesn't require a lot of curatorial, like like having to think about how to write some descriptions and all that kind of work, which which can greatly add to an exhibit, but is not, necess not necessary. You can create a, a very simple exhibit pretty quickly. Um, okay, so the next thing I thought I'd, we'd do is, is explore the configuration stuff a little bit more. Um, and here I wanted to point out a couple things. Um, you'll see there's two sections here, configuration and configuration. Curation. Oh, curation, right. Um, and this, this uh, relates a little bit to the different, the two um, levels of users we have um, in terms of exhibit building. So we have um, uh, two, Spotlight comes with two uh, distinct types of uh, user types. Uh, one is an admin, and an admin can basically do everything that we're, that we're showing you so far, um, they can do all this kind of configuration and they can do the config, uh, curation stuff that we'll look at. Um, so the admin is the most powerful exhibit builder. Uh, but we also have a role, uh, and I'm gonna switch over to users to show this a little more clearly. Um, uh, we also have another role um, that is called the curator role And um, the curator doesn't see, when the curator's logged in, they don't see the whole configuration section here. They just see the, cur the curation, which are more the page building features. 
And so the idea here is that uh, when you're building an exhibit, you might often do that as a team. Um, and maybe you have the, the admins or the people that you, know, the one, you want the most control over the exhibit. They can change the title of the exhibit. Uh, they can change the banner and, and things like that. But maybe have some you know, student assistants or some other people helping you with the exhibit that you don't want to, you want to help build pages, but you don't want them to actually have control over the title and things like that. So you would just assign them the, the curator role, um, and that would sort of limit their, their privileges a little bit. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm not going to go into all the detail of all the configuration, but just to hit some highlights of the key things that you can do to, to tailor your exhibit. So an obvious thing here is on the general configuration uh, would be to change the title. Uh, maybe the title you when you when you first requested your exhibit is not one you want to you want to keep. You maybe want to change that. You can change that here. Um, you can add a subtitle. Um, And um, you can add a description, which shows up in those flippy cards on the, um, that Bain landing page we, we started off with. Um, the tags are also used on that page to filter exhibits. Um, you can add contact emails that get uh, those email addresses you add here will get uh, responses to this feedback form that's available to end users. The feedback form is kind of neat. I don't know if you were planning on talking about this. Feedback form is kind of neat just simply because it um, it always pops up at the top that way, no matter what page you're on. And then when it sends the feedback, it, it, it's obviously the text of the feedback, but also references the page the user was on when they submitted feedback so you know kind of where they were. So I'm going to save this page just to show you how that we change the title and the subtitle. So now we have a subtitle. Um, so that's good. We, we started to customize this a little bit. Um, and um, another thing we might want to do is customize the appearance. So um, this is an important important feature. We can change the masthead and add a, a, an image behind the masthead. So I'm going to do that real quick. Um, and in this, there's two ways to um, add a masthead image. Uh, one is to use content from the actual exhibit. So that would be this, this feature here where um, you can start typing the title of um, uh, an item, and you'll see the autocomplete here will start to show you items that match what you're typing. And you could pick one of those and um, use that as a, uh, an image to crop. Um, uh, for reasons I won't get into, I'm going to actually upload <laughs> an image instead. That's another option is you can upload an image that you know you have saved outside of the exhibit. Yeah, a lot of times when we do these exhibits, we actually make custom banners and that might have other kinds of labels. So it's a it's a useful to be able to pull an image from the exhibit or create a custom banner. Yeah. Um, we've been we've been making some changes to the way this works in the last in the last sprint. So it'll the demo will go more smoothly. We hope if we we hope yeah we hope something funny's happening. Yeah, I thought this would be work fine. Um, Sure. Usually this is pretty straightforward, uh, I promise. Uh, but basically, uh, when you upload an image, either using the from the exhibit or uploading, uh, it will show um, the image here. And then you have a little crop box, and you can just crop it. And it keeps the right aspect ratio for the masthead. Um, so uh, it's a fixed um, crop box. I think it's because we're using Safari, and maybe we have some bugs there that we didn't. Oh, that worked. So it, Okay, there it is. Odd. But from before. Ah, uh, okay, could be. Yeah. So here, here's um, yeah. So here's our crop box. We can you know um, adjust that and so on. Um, and when we save it, it just be saved behind our, our masthead here. So that's a nice way. Now we're starting to make it look like you know something actually interesting instead of uh, the generic uh, sort of look you get by default. Uh, there's other things you can do. The site thumbnail. Is another way to crop, and that's what shows up um, back on the. Um, if we save a site thumbnail, it's not used in the exhibit itself, but it's used for this thumbnail right here. And this description here is you is was also on that um, where we did title, subtitle. We could also add a description. This description it shows up here. 
So that's a nice thing that the curator, the, basically the curator has no control over this page except for that the, the title, subtitle, description, and thumbnail that they save ends up being used here automatically once they publish the exhibit. Okay, so um, the other sort of appearance thing I want to point out real quick is the main menu. Um, and by default, um, we, ha we have uh, the about page uh, menu, we have browse menu item and a uh, menu item called curated features, uh, which we'll get to in just a minute. Um, but these are default names. Um, like I showed you before, you can reorder these. Um, and um, this would make more sense if I actually were showing, we haven't produced any of those pages, so we're not showing them in the main menu. But um, once you have them, you can change their names just by um, clicking in um, the title. You can change the title of those, so you have customization of the title. You can reorder them, and you can turn them on and off if you don't want them to show. One of the interesting, just to, uh, an aside, one of the interesting um, bits of feedback that we've gotten, and I think it's a, another roadmap item, is we've heard, so there's four, there's four top level menu items, and that's kind of fixed. Is you can change their names, you can change their labels, you can turn them on or, on or off, but it, it's home, about, browse, and then curated features, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we have gotten feedback from folks that they want the ability to create kind of more of a menu structure. Of course, in our initial rollout, we wanted to limit that because if you give folks the ability to create as many menus as they want, they'll create 15 and that doesn't fit on the horizontal bar and it doesn't really work for users. Um, but we'll find some, some intermediate uh, uh, solution to enable folks to create um, slightly, more, uh, slightly more menus and a little bit more kind of hierarchy to, to sites uh, within, within, within reason for user experience. And, th and that's an example of, um an issue that, that, that we kind of have to address in several aspects of the exhibit is sort of that balance between if it's self-service and we let people just kind of go crazy and do whatever they want, now we don't really have good control over what our you know, what our exhibits that represent our institution, right? So we want some control, but at the same time, we don't want all our exhibits to just be very cookie cutter and, and have the same look and, and feature, uh, you know, be exact the same. So. We're trying to balance, figure out how we can kind of balance the, the um, flexibility for the curator, but it still sort of have some some consistency and uh, control over things. So here's another you know example of that is uh, the metadata. So we we saw earlier when we went to a search results page for the brand new exhibit um, that we were in gallery view, we had a lot of metadata, uh, which is kind of a lot of metadata to look at when you're in a in a, a view that's supposed to highlight the the images. So um, we have a configuration category here called metadata. And um, what this does is it shows all the, the possible metadata fields uh, for the items in your exhibit here on the left. And then on the top here, we show the different pages in the exhibit um, on which metadata might be shown. So this is essentially the item details um, page. Uh, when you click on an item and you see all the, the details, and then the other um, pages here are um, the different result views. Um, so list view, gallery view, and so on. And so um, by default, they're all checked. That's why when we went to the gallery view, we saw a lot of metadata. Um, but when I do gallery view, usually I want very minimal metadata, usually just the title. Um, because I figure if somebody's picking, I'm picking the gallery view, they want to see the images and not really see a lot of metadata. So usually list view leaves most of the metadata on there. Gallery view, I'll go and turn everything off. Um, and same with uh, most of these other views. And so this is really easy to do. Um, and if you want to you know, be selective and say, well, maybe on the, the masonry view, I'll show author. Um, you can just click that, save the changes. And now I'll just do a quick search, just prove that this works. And now we're in gallery view. Now we just have the title, and we don't see all that metadata. So we get a nicer, cleaner look. But of course, list view, I didn't turn it off, so we'll still see all the metadata in list view. So that's an, an easy feature to, to, uh, to use, um, but gives the, the ability to, to customize things a lot in terms of the metadata. Um, so so one, other, one other feature there, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a consistent theme throughout, throughout the configuration menu, and it's, it's a level of flexibility that is 
um, I think extraordinary and scary at the same time is the ability to actually change labels. So for example, to, to change the metadata labels in the, in the interface um, just by kind of clicking and typing over. Um, yeah, maybe an ex uh, a particular exhibit subject is, is maybe more like um, time, time uh, ranges or something like that, let's say. Um, so using the default uh, label of subject maybe isn't so so descriptive as maybe era. So you can just go in and change that to era, and now everywhere with that metadata field is shown, the label will be era instead of um, uh, region or whatever I clicked on subject. Um, now this is, this only affects the the item within the, the exhibit context. It doesn't change anything about the record. So we're not we're not affecting the record itself. Uh, the other thing that I, that I glossed over here, um, but again, is kind of useful, is if you want to change the order of these, you can drag and drop, and um, that order will be uh, reflected whenever you see the metadata on a page. So. Can you exhibit specific fields we didn't talk about here? Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, so um, at the bottom here, there's also this little section that's empty right now called exhibit specific fields. And so all this metadata up here, um, those are, that's metadata that comes from our record. In this case, these are Stanford Digital Repository items, so they're, they're metadata that's associated with our, our records, um, our, our mods. Today. Um, but maybe in some, in some cases, you might be doing an, uh, creating an exhibit where you want some additional fields that aren't actually part of the, the item records themselves, but would be useful to show metadata about to exhibit visitors. So one, one example I often use when talking about this is, um, as it was the case with the Fitch exhibit uh, that Stu showed, that was an actual physical exhibition in the, the Green Library at Stanford, um, and then the Fitch exhibit was kind of like a companion, the, the, the digital exhibit was like a companion to the physical exhibition. Um, so in that case where you have like a digital companion, maybe you'd want a uh, field that uh, helps people uh, know where this item, a given item is in the physical uh, exhibition. So um, I might call, make a, um, a custom field called exhibit case. Um, and so this could be the display case that the item is in, in the physical exhibition. And so once I, I save that, um, you'll see here we now have a new field added to our list called um, exhibit case, and when I do, now as a curator, um, this is uh, something that end users aren't gonna see, but when I click on an item, and then I see this edit button, um, I can now go, I get the, my custom field is added to this page in edit mode, and I can go and say, you know, this item is in case three. Um, and when I save that, we'll see now end users will be able to see that this, um, this item is in case three of the physical exhibition. Another interesting use of this, I mean, in, on the kind of opposite end of the intellectual spectrum is you might have faculty experts, you know, and you might want to have them write some commentary on a handful of objects. So it could be faculty commentary or expert commentary, um, uh, and, and they could go in and it might not be a description that you'd normally put in your in your in your record or your catalog, but you really want it to be to be displayed on the record page for an, an exhibit in the exhibit. Yeah, and a good example of that from a physical exhibition would might be the um, the description you have on the card, like the, the in the physical exhibition, which may be very unique to the. I think um, we did that in one of our one of our exhibits did that where they the curators basically copied the text they had prepared for the physical exhibition and little display cards or whatever right. they're called and use that as a custom field. Um, okay, so let me jump back to, yeah, we do a lot of time. The little tray is time. Okay, I'll try to finish maybe 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So uh, real quick, uh, a couple options related to search. Um, the, the big one I should want to show you here, I'll, I'll, real quick since we're on this page, we, we have, we have um, the ability to sort of customize several aspects of the search the search box. Uh, one is we now have fielded search available. Um, so this page lets you kind of control um, the display of fielded search. So end users can see this and be able to restrict their search to certain fields, like author, for example. Um, we can also turn that off if we think it's not really 
I always think some, some of our exhibits are not really, they're intended to be more browsable and not really, we don't expect users to do serious searching of them. And so I'll like turn all these off um, if I'm helping with the exhibit and um, just get rid of that, um, that extra pull down, make it a little cleaner. Um, we can turn off uh, this, this, in a different place, we can turn off the search box altogether if you really want to make a, a browsable site. Um, but the, the really key thing here uh, for search configuration is the facets. And so um, uh, these are, uh, of course, the, oops, the facets here on the left uh, that you see that, that can be on the home page. It's optional on the home page. There's an option to turn it off. But you'll see on a search results page all these facets. Uh, for many exhibits, even if they have items in the facets, uh, they might not be what you really expect end users to want to use uh, for exploring the exhibit, and they might be, it might make your page kind of cluttered with a lot of them. So we have the ability to, um, just as we do with metadata, we can turn off uh, facets that we don't want to show. So it's, it's really easy to just uncheck things that we don't want to show. Um, as with the metadata, we can um, drag and drop to change the order. Uh, which you might, might want to do even more with facets to kind of have like the most useful facets at the top of the order. Um, and again, you can click on them to give them a better name for the, the exhibit purpose. Um, there's also some options you can do here about whether they, uh, the value sort by frequency or, or the value name. Um, so that's a nice way to sort of um, tidy up your, your facet display. Um, and then you can also choose, um, uh, when we looked at the search results, we saw all the search result views available, but you can turn those off. So if your um, exhibit doesn't have any geo uh, data, you wouldn't want to show a map view. Um, and maybe you want to just be really um, you know, streamlined and just show a list and a gallery view. So you can turn those off. You can control over how many results are shown by default on a page. And you can do that. So, so now on our, our search results page, we have a smaller list of facets, and we only have two, two search results available for the end user. So, um, yeah, I think that, that gives you a sense of how you can start to tailor the, the options that end users um, get to see. Um, and you can kind of, and, and those, the choices you'll make will probably depend on the, the type of exhibit you're, you're building and, and sort of what you have in mind for, for users to see. So, so that's configuration. That was sort of that second big aspect activity of creating an exhibit. Um, and the third um, is actual um, curatorial, adding curatorial sort of expertise and content um, description. Um, and that gets into these, these features here. Um, we've already seen browse. Um, and um, so that leaves sort of, well, let's see. Let me go see if I can um, just turn these on, even though they won't have images. Um, so I published these three browse categories. So that's populated the main menu with a browse now because we actually have some brow, uh, published items here. They're not going to look at here because I, I didn't save the images for them, but um, I'll just skip that in the interest of time for now. Um, so that's the browse category. Now the other thing we have to, we can do in terms of content creation is create pages. So there are um, really, uh, there are three distinct page types, so they're all just variations of the, the same thing. Uh, in other words, uh, well, as we'll see, building them is the same process. Uh, so there are the feature pages that, that Stu had mentioned earlier, and the home page is a special variant of feature pages um, in that you can only have one. Feature pages, you can create as many as you want. The home page, obviously, you can only have one home page. So that's one thing special about the home page. Um, there's also some uh, one or two options um, you can do that are specific to the home page. Um, so we'll, we'll look at the home page in a second, but while we're here, um, I'm going to add some feature pages. So um, let me give it some quick title. And so to start off, one way to do this is just to create a couple of titles. So these are just going to be sort of um, placeholder empty empty pages that are going to be available for us to work on. Um, and we haven't published them, so we can work on them, but they're not going to show up anywhere in the main menu. Um, the home page, though, of course, is always enabled. So let's go to the home page. 
Uh, this box is intended to kind of help the curator get started, um, actually adding, uh, building the exhibit and getting some things going. So we're ready to, to actually populate this homepage. So I'm gonna edit it. And this is what all the pages, the homepage, about page, about pages and feature pages look like when you, when you start um, to work on them. So you just get sort of the empty page with the title here, um, and you'll see this plus sign. And this, this is the way to um, trigger or to, to access um, the widgets. So the widgets are, um, there's a variety of widgets you can use to compose your page. So they're just, they're blocks. Widgets take like the full width of the, the page, each widget, and there's a lot of variations of them, and, and really building a page is just selecting widgets, configuring the widgets, and sort of choosing the order you want them on a page. So I'll start by doing something super quick um, and just doing some text. Um, let me click the, just so this is a little bit uh, realistic, let me grab some text. So I'm gonna populate some text here, and I'll just save this. And you'll see now our homepage actually has some content. So it's very simple, but um, that's that's how easy it is to, to just start using the widgets. And so, so creating the page is just um, kind of doing this, um, picking the right widgets to sort of get the, the look and the, the, the content you want. So obviously just text is not very useful for most in most cases. So um, we can go with something like um, an item row widget is um, a useful one where we can add one or more um, images from the collection or items from the collection. Um, so I'll just pick one here and um, I'm gonna add that same text. Uh, most of our widgets uh, have some options um, in terms of, uh, you can show a caption, say for example, um, we'll pick title. Um, you can choose to display the text on the left or the right. Let's say, I'm gonna keep it left here. I'm gonna save this. And so now we have this, this nicer looking block. Uh, in fact, I like that better and it's redundant, so I'm going to go in and delete the, the text block that I created. And when I save that, now we have the start of a better looking, better looking homepage. Um, and I'll just do another widget to give you a sense of um, the object, the um, variety here. So I'm going to pick browse categories, although this is not going to look that good because I didn't save images, but uh, so these are my browse categories I created earlier, and this is a nice widget because it gives you access to those browse categories. Um, and when I save that, um, you'll see another. We have a row here where. Um, we have our browse categories, and um, if you just blink for a second and pretend we're still on our test exhibit, um, here's our homepage that we're creating. Here are those the three browse categories I just created. And so the nice thing is they add visual appeal to the page, but then they also give the user a, a, an easy way in now. They can click on one, they say that looks interesting, and now they're, they're into that browse category. Um, so that's the basics of creating a page. Um, I think um, I'm not going to build any more from scratch, but I'm going to jump over to the the, um, the production exhibit thing and just show you really quickly the built pages for that exhibit. Um, so this is the about pages. It's the same same process I, I showed before. You just create a new page. You just add a title. You save it, and then you go into the page itself, and you use the widgets to um, uh, to create the content for that page. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. This is the part that requires the most sort of creativity um, on the part of the, the curator to figure out what widgets to use, what, what information you want to convey, how many about pages you might want to create, for example. Um, 
And then the other part of the about pages has this, this area for context, um, for the exhibit context. Yeah, one, one of the things that we've heard, again, talking about kind of futures um, with, uh, with, uh, with the custom pages, the features, and the about pages is some look nicer than others, so a, kind of a request to have some templates, right, of kind of nice looking pages that, that you can choose from to kind of preset um, uh, and make it easier for folks to just kind of fill in the blanks and, and get some nice pages started. And one last thing I, uh, I want to say before we turn it over to Trey. Um, is I didn't really show you about the feature pages for Matter, um, but here's an exhibit that has feature pages. They're, they're, they're built in the exact same way, um, but uh, the, the nice thing about the feature pages is you have the ability to create as many as you want, and feature pages can have child pages. So in this case, um, they're all parent pages, but each of these categories could have any number of child pages. So that gives you actually, just that two levels gives you lots of flexibility in, um, how you want to, to sort of explore topics or give the, the user ability to explore topics. You can group topics by the parent page and then have lots of detailed pages under a given topic. Um, but building them is exactly, exactly, exactly the, same, the same process. Um, but as you can see here, this is another kind of layout that this, this curator used for, for feature pages. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of flexibility in how you can um, lay out the, the details of these pages. One of the other things we hope for, one of the other things we, features we've heard about is the notion of the guided experience. So right now, the way you navigate uh, an exhibit is you click on the menus, and then you maybe have a left menu that you kind of have to choose which, which, which page you want to go to. But as we've seen in other kinds of exhibit platforms, um, there's a sequence, and you might want to have folks kind of walk through in a guided way. So we've been thinking about other interfaces for that, and I know several of our, uh, the other um, Institutions who are interested in Spotlight are thinking about that as well, and so we'd hope to see that that soon. Another um, area or opportunity for expansion of Spotlight, if you have unique if you have unique requirements, um, is the widgets. So the widget framework is is intended to be extendable. So um, we are not limited to the widgets that we see um, when when Gary does the demo. There's there are opportunities to expand Spotlight and make it a richer kind of platform by adding new widgets. Yeah, the, the, the more widgets we can add, you know, as a community, it just gives, allows a lot more flexibility for, for curators to sort of um, be able to, to build those pages in a more interesting way. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it. Should be Trey Pine, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, it worked. All right, so you, intro for real quick, Trey Pendragon. I'm from Princeton University. Uh, we're working on a Spotlight implementation right now. So you all know kind of how Spotlight works in, ge Ooh, in general, but the idea here is where Spotlight fits in in Princeton's infrastructure and the interesting little differences there. Uh, codenamed pomegranate. So in order to get into this, I want to give you a quick introduction to how things used to work so that you know where it fits into things now. So our old digital repository infrastructure, we would have a set of items and every item had one and exactly one and never zero and never two collections that it was attached to. Uh, because of that, the way things usually worked was we would say we're gonna take five items and ingest them into a digital repository, really it's like 500 items, and give them a name that makes sense for those items. And generally, because it was one and only one, they would be kind of by project instead of by curatorial purpose. Uh, so they would get assigned numbers and a title that sort of made sense, and everybody knew them by this like 
three, four digit number, which I could never get straight, but that's okay. Uh, after they were ingested, our repository would have a collection page. They looked kind of like this. They have a title, a description, uh, facets on the left for the facets that make sense, a picture that was a representation of the collection, and all of the items below it. Oftentimes that wasn't enough for our curators and they would go off and they would build their own pages because they wanted to add contact information and context around their items and nice links to things and like background information about specific items that isn't stored in the catalog or special metadata that is not inside the digital, the digital repository. Speaking of metadata, uh, one of the major problems we helped to solve with both one tool that I'll mention lightly and uh, Spotlight was the way metadata worked in our previous system was all of our records, well, a majority of our records were in the catalog as MARC records. We would take them, process them through a bunch of scripts, uh, mods would come out the other side, uh, we'd do enrichment on those items, we would do control vocabulary work and things to that extent. Uh, they would write met struct maps uh, for structural metadata and all of that would run the digital repository and none of those changes or those improvements to those mod records would ever make it back up to the mark. So now we had multiple metadata records representing the same object and they were never kept in sync. If something changed in the mark record, there was a good chance it wasn't gonna make it into the mods. And any improvements that happened in the mods was certainly not gonna make it up to the mark. Uh, then roughly 55 or 45 percent of our items don't have mark records. Instead, they have, there's a database out there with columns and they have names and our catalogers put in all the metadata into those columns and they show up in whatever discovery interface we have for that item. So, I, instead, for our new system, we decided let's just build a workflow tool where we can associate a collection ID inside our, or not a collection ID, a record ID within our catalog with digital images so that uh, we can pull in the metadata from various sources and have that in one spot, associate it with the visual images, and if metadata updates up here, we just pull it down again and do the mapping correctly. Uh, if there's any metadata that doesn't make sense to be in the context of the catalog, which happens sometimes, especially for items which don't have catalog records, uh, then go ahead and put it in, in here, and this will be our item record. That's things like portion note that you'll see there. So now, oh, the other thing, collection membership. Uh, the only way we were gonna be able to get the flexibility that we needed for things like exhibit pages that went past project boundaries and things to that extent was if we had a more generalized concept of what a collection is. So in the new system, the collections are just set of items with a title. Uh, so we can support both the project use case. These were all digitized at the same time and that's important, here's the name. And the curatorial collection use case and management of those collections all happens inside this workflow tool and each item can be a member of zero to N collections at one time. Now to get to Spotlight. Uh, the one big use case that was missing that we had in the old system was we had the page with the description and the facets on the left and the uh, item record thing over there and that page that curators wanna make that has special facets and backgrounds and 
We knew by the time we got to this thing that Spotlight filled those use cases exactly, so we spun one up. Uh, Codenamed it Pomegranate, and this is what it looks like empty and very much in development. So one big difference between our Spotlight instance and what you saw before was we have a workflow tool to manage collections, which means rather than importing items, like you saw in the interface, like there's an add item thing or you put in the IDs that you want, all we have is we have a drop down for collections which come from the other system and you pick the collection that doesn't yet have an exhibit associated with it and it'll just build one and import all the items from that collection into Spotlight and you can go from there. Stu mentioned that I would talk about IIIF and so regarding the IIIF side of things, uh, our workflow tool exports IIIF manifests for collections, items, uh, multi-volume works, and you can see this is our special top level collection. So that drop down that you saw in the front is actually powered by a collection of collections IIIF manifest, which comes straight from the workflow tool, which means it's constantly updated and we'll always be in sync. Uh, regarding IIIF and metadata, uh, I don't know how used to the metadata in IIIF you all are, but IIIF's concept of metadata has no semantic meaning. It's just, here's a label for like title, and here's a bunch of values associated with it, which turns out to be a uh, great representation for Spotlight because don't really care what the semantic meaning of it is. We care that the label of the title is title and the, all these values show up. So when we import these items, it goes through the metadata bucket that sits in the IIIF manifest and imports them as uh, exhibit specific fields, <laughs> which you saw the little drop down. It just happens programmatically instead. Um, and then because we don't want those fields to be edited by the curators, because they come from the mark record that sits in our catalog up here and was then imported into the workflow tool, uh, we wanna make sure that those can stay in sync. So we've locked down those exhibit specific fields and we mark them as read only so that we can update them and no metadata will get overridden that the curator didn't want overridden. If it turns out that they want a uh, subject, like a field name subject with different content in it, then they're free to make a new exhibit specific field and hide the other one and show the one they want and it'll all work out and stay updated. A uh, quick point about look and feel. So the big, the big win for Spotlight for us was the fulfilling the use case for those curators to go off and they build that page that you saw. So they instead here have all the power they need to make to choose the facets they want to display, to add the metadata they need to add that only makes sense in the context of the, of the exhibit. Like a very good example is the description that was on the plate that was during the exhibit when it was actually being displayed and they can add quotes and browse pages and abouts and uh, the concept of sub collections as really just a facet that you can search through which our uh, workflow tool has no concept of sort of on purpose. All of that can be built out in Spotlight which means we'll, the goal <laughs> is to never have these sites out there built by somebody else that we never hear about and which pull images, maybe locally, maybe not, which have viewers that differ from what we expect our users to be able to view with the structural metadata and everything we expect them to be able to have access to in the digital repository. Now all of that can be in one place and show up the way we expect it to and be kept in sync with accurate metadata all up and down the line.
regarding sync. So I mentioned that you hit the little, the money will make sense, will make sense in just a moment. I mentioned that you hit the little drop down and you pick the collection you want to create and it imports all the items. That works great, except for the cases where the metadata changes, the item gets removed from the collection, a new item gets added to the collection later, uh, an item's access permissions are changed, so if I no longer am able to display an item in the repository, then I definitely don't want to display it in my exhibit either. So how do we keep these disparate systems in sync? Uh, this is gonna get kind of technical, but, so the way we do that is every time we edit an item or change it in any way in our workflow tool, we fire an event off to RabbitMQ, which is a message queue service, and that event gets distributed to, from the exchange that we send it to, Plum Events, our workflow tool is called Plum, uh, gets distributed to any queues that bind to that event, or to that exchange, like Pomegranate. So Pomegranate binds a queue to that exchange, and every event, for instance, I added an item, or I edited this item, or the permissions for this item has changed, all those events get sent to this and handled by Pomegranate so that it knows that it needs to go out and re-index the IIIF manifest. Because of that, we can have three different systems at different tiers of importance with different contexts and still keep the metadata silos non-existent. So we can have metadata here that persists and keeps up to date all the way down here and we can have a viewer that displays correctly no matter where you are in the stack. I'm gonna try and show this off and we'll see how it goes. Uh, what I would like to show is I mentioned oops. I mentioned we use triple IF. So when it ingests an item with with the IIIF manifest URL, because of that, it's able to keep a constant link to a defined source of IIIF, and we can run Universal Viewer as our basic viewer in uh, both our workflow tool and Pomegranate, which means you can get structural metadata displayed in both, and it should be able to display a various, various types of items with all the different controls that IIIF will let you have like, hey, I want to display this uh, two up, for instance. Um, that's it. 
uh, I think I had a question slide, but since this is the end, I think we're just going to do general Q&A now. And with a little luck, we'll have uh, microphones on both sides. So um, we are streaming this and recording, so we'd love to capture your questions on the mic rather than have them dimly echoing uh, through the speaker's podium. So I'll go on the other side. So, questions? Hi. Um, so I wrote this down because I thought we were handing these in, so I'm going to read from it. Would you address methods of ingest for items and item metadata in bulk? Does this always need to be configured by software engineers at an institution to integrate with the institution's infrastructure, or is there some other bulk method like OAI, PMH, data provider, et cetera? And then if you could, there's a second kind of part to that, which is, therefore, what metadata is supported in terms of standards? I noticed that you were using mods, but is that what is indexed and supported in general in display? or are there options? Uh, okay, I'm gonna try and answer this and we'll go over here after that. Uh, so I think you can only bulk index as well as there are standards to represent the metadata that you're indexing. So in our case at Princeton, we use IIIF, which means since there's no semantic meaning, we can just ingest everything that sits inside the metadata container and the spec that is IIIF powers that. So our bulk ingest is that. It's defined somewhere else and we just ingest it that way. Uh, option two is there's the CSV ingest, which actually has, a, you might have seen it, there's a link there to download a template and I believe that template's powered by the fields that are present in the configuration for Spotlight. So if you download that template and fill it out and upload that, then that would work as bulk ingest. Uh, there, uh, is this true? Or is there a plugin for OAI? So the, the other answer to the question, I guess, if you had a mic, um, is just like Blacklight, Spotlight doesn't really care where your metadata comes from or what format it's in. Um, it just cares that you've been able to put it into an index. Um, so even though I think both our institutions are using mods, there's nothing inherently mod-centric about um, the implementation. And I don't, we haven't seen much convergence around um, metadata formats and how different institutions express um, their metadata consistently. Um, so I don't think there's been any effort to, to create plugins for generic indexing. Um, it's conceivable, I just don't think it's happened yet. I, I have heard a rumor um, that an institution in the New England area who's thinking of adopting Spotlight is looking to um, create a workflow for indexing from an OAI PMH data provider. <laughs> what I was gonna say, uh, also, when we, and we are going to get it, and there's going to be more time for, 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 for Q&A afterwards, but if you have another question during this session, introduce yourself first, because I had a suspicion. <laughs> I understand that Spotlight is being used to display web archived websites. And I was wondering how that was being done. Is it just reducing a website to single images or is there some way to duplicate the complex nature of a website in Spotlight? Okay, and, and can you introduce yourself, sorry? Um, Ellen Hammond, head of international collections at in the Yale Library. Great, thanks. So, I'm not sure of that case. Um, I can say that at Stanford, um, and this may be this may be what you're referring to. At Stanford, we have um, uh, we have the ability to ingest web. We now have the ability to ingest archive websites into our digital repository, and we have an embeddable viewer 
um, and it's kind of a generic embeddable viewer that um, was built to link um, uh, web archive seed records to our instance of the Wayback Machine. And the viewer, um, what it essentially does, and there's kind of an algorithm that generates uh, a, a thumbnail um, for uh, some kind of distributed representation of captures for that particular record um, and displays kind of a timeline interface. And I could probably try to find, find one maybe in the afternoon session when we're not being recorded. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really cool widget, and, and, and you, can, you can see it in our online catalog search works, in our Perl pages, our persistent URL kind of citation pages. And that embed widget, that embed viewer, is also the viewer that drives, that, that is displayed in Spotlight. So it's very conceivable for us to create a Spotlight exhibit based on um, web, archived websites and basically you've got the metadata that so happens to be mods about that seed record. We have the ability to generate this viewer that has these thumbnails representing captures for a seed record. So you could create an exhibit of, of web captures, right? Um, we don't have one yet. I would love for us to build one. Um, that, that would be an exciting prospect. I don't know if we have one in the pipeline yet, but at, in Stanford's implementation, it's totally conceivable. So instead of that zoom pan image viewer, you get this kind of thumbnail driven timeline that's interactive that then, that then links you out to our version of the Wayback. Sure. Any other before lunch? I, I just have a question about um, getting more information about the actual primary sources that you have listed in the metadata. I was looking, for instance, when you had the heat mapping mm. um, slides, you, you did have a, a source listed there, and I just wondered if the person doing research would be able to figure out how the overlay, the visual overlay was created. You know, what, you know, what uh, data went into that, and what's the source of that data, and how can they verify it, maybe do some other studies based on, on that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think so if so I'm understanding I'm your... I'm just thinking that the, um, the more and more metadata we have, we get farther away from our original material and things get generalized and then regeneralized. And, and so I just wondered how you... Could you add more uh, material to get back to your primary source, for instance? So to, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the question about the primary source. So I, I originally thought what you were asking is, is and we've heard this before, um, adding functionality, for example, to download the raw metadata, to, or to download the raw data um, that was used to derive the, the geospatial representation. Um, and GeoBlacklight has that. Our, um, our geospatial widget has that. Uh, Spotlight does not natively, unless you, you, you kind of have that built into your display mechanism, does not have that functionality. But certainly we've heard people ask for us to provide point or two or download of the raw version of the metadata. Um, the, the exhibit creator or the data provider could also, um, at their discretion, kind of add that, add that provenance information about the, the way the data was created. So, yeah. so I, ju I just want to take that opportunity to kind of clarify again that Spotlight is just sort of configurable blacklight. And by that, I mean, if you can get it in the index, then you can display it, which means if you have the data, right, if you have the source data, then just put it in the index and put a link to it and it'll show up. Yeah, to some, to some extent, it's this, we, we've started to make this transition from Spotlight as a technology to Spotlight as a service. And one of the reasons that we created a service team was because this feels a little bit more like a policy, an, a, an intellectual policy question than it is a technical question. Um, so this is a perfect example of, of, of kind of developing some best practices for the way we, um, we, we, we 
we build exhibits and we build collections and the kind of either advice or guidelines or best practices that we document for exhibit builders to include kind of that pathway back to primary sources. Um, and our, our service team is now kind of, um, kind of taking in some of those considerations and trying to, to document them and build a little bit of lightweight policy around um, the creation of these exhibits. after any, any last any last pre lunch ones. I will say that after lunch we're going to expect lots of interactivity. I'm going to ask a few of you to introduce yourselves and talk about your interest in Spotlight and, and talk about your card. So it was good that you read your card because that'll be a uh, that that could be a practice in the afternoon. And yeah. Yeah. Can folks leave their cards on the table outside and then we'll do some sorting over lunch. Mike? And I'll just remind everyone there are a few floors of uh, excellent artwork upstairs. So if you have a few minutes after you've had your lunch, feel free to go up and visit the collection. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, 130.